welcome to another ass-kicking round of No Franchise Fatigue, the monthly podcast dedicated to analyzing and praising the cinematic franchise. No matter how many sequences, sequels, prequels, reboots, remakes, reimaginings, or remakewals they have. I'm just going to keep adding in new terms as uh, directors and stuff, <laughs> throw those in there. My name is Matt Reifschneider, and I'm joined by my vengeance-driven co-host, Sean Kaler. How are you today, sir? Well, glad this is uh, glad this isn't a video podcast because I dressed up as a fighter from India. Oh, oh, yeah, that's rough. That is <laughs> that's a rough one. I was wondering why you turned off your video on uh, on Skype. Don't understand why you make these choices. <laughs> you make some bold choices, sir. And so do the movies today that we're going to be talking about. So, um, thank you all for listening, guys. Um, today we're going to be talking about. Uh, two films that I have mixed feelings at overall, but I do enjoy these films. And I feel like this is a time for us to really dig into our into the past a little bit and look at a franchise that many people don't even know exist, which is the one-armed boxer films uh, directed, written, and starring the iconic Jimmy Wang Yu. And for my part, I am playing the part of person who did not know this was a franchise. I had seen the second movie, as I found out most people have, without even realizing it was a sequel. Yeah, and uh, you'd be shocked. I've actually... So the movies that we're going to be talking about today, in in case you guys need to know, are the original The One-Armed Boxer from 1972 or 1971, depending on uh, the different sites for information that you have out there. Uh, 1972 seems to be the general consensus. Uh, And then its sequel, Master of the Flying Guillotine from 1976. Yes, the sequel... Or... One arm boxer versus the flying guillotine because every movie from the seventies had to have thirty titles. It this especially Hong Kong films, man. Like this one, this one also is also known as the one arm boxer two. Uh, it's just that one's kind of a, a title for different countries and things like that. So um, yeah, it's a franchise that many people don't know exists. A lot of people know the sequel thanks to how many modern directors and audiences reference this film. Uh, for Master of the Flying Guillotine. But uh, it's a franchise many people don't know exists, and uh, I think it's one that's worth worth talking about for a variety of reasons, and, and we'll kind of jump into that in a second, because there's a lot to discuss here, believe it or not. A lot of martial arts films uh, tend to play things pretty straightforward or upfront, um, particularly from this era of the 70s. But there's a lot to discuss here. But before we get to that, let's get some business out of the way first. So if you like what you hear today, please... Check out our expanding back catalog wherever you listen to your podcasts on Anchor.fm, Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or our newest avenue, YouTube. Um, Check out our other series. Uh, This is No Franchise Fatigue, but we do have two other series going currently. Uh, That is Good, Bad, Weird, Wild, and Fatigued But Not Forgotten. Uh, We are a weekly podcast, even though this kind of episode, the No Franchise Fatigue, is only once a month uh, for all your weird cinematic uh, analysis needs. And, uh, you know, while you're there, guys, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Otherwise, we might lose our heads. We just might lose our heads. Mm. Or a limb or two. I mean, that's a running, a reoccurring theme in these movies. Boy, that ain't a joke. Uh, Appendages lost and things like that. So, So, yeah, yeah, let's just jump in. How did you, I I know you said you didn't realize this was a franchise. How did you, do you saw Master of the Flying Guillotine first? Um, Yeah, that's actually, that's one of those movies, I couldn't even tell you specifically when I saw it. I don't specifically remember, but um, it was certainly in my teens when I I went through a huge uh, Hong Kong phase. Um, and it is just one of those movies. Um, at the same time, I'm a huge, uh, Street Fighter fan, which has often said that it is a, it it kind of references both of these movies, although every interview I've ever heard with that specific description was that it was, uh, both of these movies disparately, they never actually said they were sequels, so I never put it together and I'd never seen one on Boxer before. So it's exciting. So this was a first time watch for you then. It was. 
Yeah. Yeah, I actually came to these movies late, too, a little bit. Um, obviously, I went through my Hong Kong phase in my teens, uh, you know, thanks mostly to John Woo and the Heroic Bloodshed films. But um, I, that that quickly got me into martial arts films, which is something I've been uh, a fan of throughout my teens and whatnot. But I actually didn't see these movies until much later, after college, in fact. And uh, Master of the Flight Guillotine was the one that I had seen kind of first. It's a film I've seen multiple times. I've actually seen it theatrically, uh, which is a blast to watch if you get an audience with this film, because this film is wild. Um, and it wasn't until much later that I got to see One Arm Boxer. Um, through the Shout Factory, uh, it's now out of print, box set that they did, the Jimmy Wang Yu collection uh, that was included on in this box set. And it's a nice, um, I don't know, you watched it on Amazon Prime, right? The One Arm Boxer? Uh, I did. It was a nice copy in a fairly modern dub. Um, but... You know, if it's not, like, one of their kind of prime releases, it doesn't have the world's best server space. So my yeah. my presentation of it was kind of choppy and sort of felt like I was in a grindhouse theater where the uh, projector was <laughs> melting the film every two minutes. <laughs> this is Welcome to the world of uh, trying to find uh, old martial arts movies. I there was, a, there was actually a copy I watched of a film on amazon prime that had tracking problems on it so <laughs> say, say what Oof. you will <laughs> about this but um as a fan of martial arts films this is something that you quite often run into uh either you you can't find your original language or uh, you have to subscribe to a dub or you know it's the quality of the film is usually pretty subpar the the one on the Sh the shout factory uh, dvd um, that I have the Jimmy Wayne new collection is actually a pretty good restoration on there. It's a subtitled one. So I'm actually kind of curious to hear if there's, uh, I, it's been so long since I've seen the dubbed version of it. It's just been so long since I've seen it to be able to like accurately kind of, uh, say the difference between the dubs and subs. So I'm curious to see, uh, if there's any comments you make that are like wildly different, you'll be like, Oh, this guy said this. And I'll be like, no, he didn't. Um, cause that's oftentimes uh, the difference between dubs and subs is completely different context. So, uh, why don't we just jump straight, uh, you know, uh, straight into the first film. I, there's a lot of things I want to talk about with these films in terms of their history, um, to give, uh, our audience out there a little bit of context about this. Hopefully this will be enlightening, uh, to some of you out there and convince you to watch these films because they're definitely worth it. So, so why don't we, uh, jump into the one-armed boxer directed by Jimmy Wang Yu. A young martial artist named Tian Lung enters a tea house and sees members of the Iron Hook Gang bullying a man and trying to steal his bird. So they fight him off and decide to meet for a real fight in the valley a few minutes later, you know, ostensibly taking it outside. And the Iron Hooks are beaten badly. They run back to their master with their tail between their legs and claim that Tian Lung also had insulted their school. So their master comes to Tian's school and gets beaten by Tian's master. And the way these always go, the Iron Hook gang lord, who's also like a gangster, he like runs opium and has prostitutes and gambling houses and stuff, hires international martial artist mercenaries to kill everyone in our good guy school and in the course of that Tian Lung survives but has his arm taken by the evil Japanese master from Okinawa who literally is a goddamn vampire he is rescued by a medicine man who basically uh, has this elixir that will make one of his arms strong enough to be a warrior again but he has to kill all the nerves so he has to put his hand in a fire put his hand in the elixir and train up in a couple of new esoteric techniques so that he can try and take revenge and serve justice serving justice one arm at a time <laughs> so I, I i like your synopsis i love in this movie that we have the iron hook gang and literally in the subtitled version, they're referred to as the Justice Club. <laughs> I just want to point out 
um, <laughs> that Jimmy Wang use Blueberry Boys because they all wear blue. Uh, they are the Justice Club. So guess which one is the good guys and which one is the bad guys? <laughs> is it Justice so, or Iron Hook? Um, I'd like to say, first off, my my first impressions and things I really liked about this movie. Um, there is just something about a nice, simple plot. Good guys, bad guys, etc. And this movie is very, very simple. Two, for, uh, even for a 70s movie, like this is kind of shockingly gory it, it's it's definitely 70s gore you know you're not getting a hostile movie here or anything but like tien getting his arm chopped off that's actually pretty gnarly it happens in camera oh yeah this is um i mean jimmy wing Yu is not uh you know obviously he's the writer director and star of this film but um he's 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 no stranger to uh mm-hmm. this kind of story this kind of uh a film. In fact, the one on boxer is kind of a combination of two of his previous films. Uh, one of them being the Chinese boxer and the other one being the one armed swordsman. Uh, both of them were huge hits for him. The Chinese boxer being his first directorial debut, um, his first directorial debut. <laughs> That's <laughs> you know, repetitively opposed... redundant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, actually yeah. I would argue Stanley Kubrick and James Cameron would both argue that they had multiple directorial debuts. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, he's he's. It, this is a movie that's a kind of a combination of the two stories. Um, and I have a lot of you can you can probably call them somewhat controversial opinions about Jimmy Wang Yu, and and I actually believe that he's actually a fantastic actor and a director, and he gets to strut both of both of those in, in the one arm boxer and in its follow-up. But here you get to see him play in a little bit of, of both areas. So I do appreciate that you really like this. It is a simple story. It's a basic formulaic Kung Fu flick in a lot of ways, rival schools, you know, the, the hero must overcome an obstacle to defeat a much superior villain down to uh, having to master an esoteric art at the end of the second act slash beginning a third act that will spontaneously win him the day. Oh, absolutely. I mean, who needs balance in martial arts when you can just kill all the nerve endings in your hand, burn it to KFC extra, extra crispy. I mean, his hand is black for the last third of this. I mean, they literally just paint it black to show that it's burned. Although, speaking of, um, if I may touch on, boy, this movie uses brown face. Oh, okay, yeah. We do we really want to get into the foreign fighters at this point? Should we well, already talk I think about in these the guys? Sense that um, it's worth getting into the foreign fighters because they are actually pretty cool. In theory, it's it's part of like I said, the street fighter thing. You know, these are world warriors. So you got the man from Okinawa and his two disciples who are totally jerks, but they all do, you know, karate air quotes. Um. Then there's, like, the judo guy, who that fight scene's actually really cool. And you've got two llamas from Tibet who have magical powers, because of course they do. And if I'm not missing anyone else, then there's the fighter from India, who is literally a heavyset dude in brown face whose special power is walking on his hands? Yeah. Yeah, I guess. That's completely accurate. (laughs) (laughs) But, yeah, you just... The foreign fighters is an interesting element. As you mentioned in your synopsis, the lead Japanese guy does literally have fangs in this movie. Um, so you can't get through this movie without at least talking about the the essence of the other, put that in quotes, the other, uh, and which translates in a lot of ways to racism uh, in mm-hmm. this film. I Not intentionally, um, but definitely this idea that like outsiders coming into China um, are not welcome. Right. These are foreign fighters. They're all mercenaries. They're all bad guys and they all deserve to be slaughtered. Right. Right. Um, It's a theme that's carried over in a lot of martial arts films and still through this day carried over in a lot of Chinese cinema. Um, And it's something that especially when it comes to Japanese characters and whatnot, it is they be they be very quickly become the go to villain in so many films. Um, You know, if the. If the U.S. loves to use Nazis or Russians as villains in action movies, uh, these guys like to use the Japanese. And part of that is that most martial arts films do have are set in a historical time period. 
Um, and so it's uh, oftentimes it's during occupation uh, when Japan was occupying China or things like that. And to this day, China st still has not forgiven Japan for the occupation or, or the British for that matter. So in, mm. in so many ways. So And the Brits are bad guys in kung fu movies very frequently as well. Very frequently. So there's definitely this idea of the outsider being the villain. This film, you know, quadruple, you know. Uh, decatuples down on it. I don't know what the term for 10 times is, <laughs> but uh, it literally just hammers down on it again and again and again in this, where your hero is, quite frankly, kind of the nice guy of the Justice Club who's just kind of uh, defending the common you know, people against all these criminals. It's something that I actually kind of appreciated, but everything pops off based on a lie. Tian Lung did not insult the Iron Hooks. He whooped the ass but he didn't yeah. insult him. Whoop they ass. No, he didn't. And they lie about it. And they, the movie makes it very, very straightforward that they lie about it when they go and talk to their master about it. Um, yeah. That, that that's what he did. So um, it's going into this kind of the fighter thing. What's fascinating about this movie is its structure, because for a movie that's called the one arm boxer, he actually doesn't become the one on boxer until the third act. So, As a matter of fact, um, the the attack on the school comprises the entire second act. It is a very long fight scene. That's uh, when we get a little more into detail. I'll, I'll touch on that. But um, but in and of itself, I I just found it fascinating that literally kind of like how Mad Max's entire third or sorry uh, Road Warriors entire third act is a chase. Um, this movie's entire second act is a fight scene. Yeah, it's it's one of the things that makes this movie, as you mentioned, the the plot is simple. It's very much a formulaic martial arts film uh, in terms of narrative and plot, but the amount of action that this film has stuffed into it, I mean, immediately you're introduced you're introduced to the restaurant, the bird restaurant where people are bringing their birds, uh, which is commonplace in a lot of martial arts films. You'll see those kinds of places, um, and you know, immediately there's a fight. Bang. You know, five minutes into this movie, there's a fight. You know, five minutes later, there's another fight <laughs> when the schools go take it outside and they have this big fight. And then you get a little bit of side story about the different schools and kind of what's going on. And then, as you said, the entire second act is a fight sequence. And once he loses his arm and uh, goes and trains for it, it's a montage, a training montage, uh, which is certainly action packed to its own regards. And then the, the last 20 minutes is an entire fight sequence mm -hmm. as he's going around kicking. Literally, he's just beating the shit out of everybody. He's like, you know, quite literally with one arm, one arm tied behind his back. Um, <laughs> Jimmy Wang knew is doing that. So it's I, I do appreciate I'm just going to take a side note right here that when he does come back and he goes back to the restaurant from the opening sequence and he goes to kick their ass and they're like, oh, you're back again. His comeback line, it might be one of the greatest comeback lines ever. And that's when he looks at him and he's like, hell was too busy. They sent me back. And you're like, that's such a great line to come back to kick some ass on. So That's a good line. Yeah. Now, I am curious. Is it just the dub I watched or is it actually inherent to the soundtrack that it's basically the Shaft theme? Nope, that is inherent to the soundtrack. The one that I watch... Um, that's pretty common with a lot of martial arts films is that you'll the there was no copyright on music in China at the time, so they just stole whatever music was available. Oftentimes you'll be watching it. Uh, the Shaft theme is very, very popular for this era of film. So yes, um, you will hear a lot of that, which is why there's a lot of difficulty getting these films released in the West um. because of music rights distribution uh, issues and things like that. So um so that's that that adds to the complication that that's such a niche audience that buys these films that makes it a little bit hard. So, um, so okay, yeah. So second act, all these fighters for that. I'm I'm I love I'm loving to pick your brain on this because I've seen this movie multiple times. I've talked with a lot of people about this, um, and as a first time watch, I'm just fascinated how you felt about. This. Oh, that's the other one. Sorry. Um, and two Thai boxers. Yep. Um, or actually in the dub. I watched, even though it was clearly a newer dub, um, just from the audio quality, they referred to them as Siamese boxers. Oh, interesting. And I wonder if that's because the, there's two of them. The idea of like Siamese twins. 
Oh, no, no, no. Um, that's uh, Thailand is, is the kingdom of Siam. It's just they, they renamed it. So, I mean, it, it was called Siamese boxing at some point. So I wonder if that's from the time period, if that's why they did that. That's got to be it, right? That's got to be um, it. But, all right. Kind of the hit and miss with me. So the the violence and the gore and the blood and, you know, these things went a long way for me in kind of covering up the fact that these guys were all actors, not martial artists. And in my research, um, and, you know, actually I'd like to flip this back on you because I I'm, think it's kind of time to broach into this since we're in the fighting of it. The choreography is very, very hit and miss. It's it's cool, but there's also a lot of edit foo. And anybody who's ever been in or seen a real fight, there's a couple of punches that the one arm boxer throws where it's like, well, he's going to break his own damn wrist because he's, you know, arm up doing motions that I, I suppose look good on camera or, you know, as he's punching towards a camera. But there it lacks the authenticity and what i understand is uh this is a man that should have always been kind of a bigger actor and the, he has charisma to spare if he told me he came from soap operas i totally believe he's man pretty for sure but he was kind of displaced by the rise of bruce lee in film and bringing kind of the authenticity to it and that's just as i understood it. i'm kind of curious your take on that but my take on the fighting is it's it's cool but the gore and some of the editing covers up a lot of iffy choreography i think yeah, I, I actually agree on this. Now, when I first reviewed this film for Blood Brothers, um, I actually gave it like a three out of five initially. And I uh, I said that the film is, is heavily flawed. And one of the things I actually said is that it's got a lot of action, but the action isn't as crisp, especially for 1972, that you would want from a, a film of, of this ilk. Now, you're correct. In your research, Jimmy Wang Yu is not a martial artist. He never was. He was kind of the big first big star in Hong Kong, like the first mega star uh, back in the 1960s, uh, particularly because of the One Armed Swordsman, which was the first Hong Kong film to make a million dollars in the box office, which is impressive because oftentimes their movies only ran for one week. So it made a million dollars in 1960, 1967, I think it's when that movie came out off the top of my head. Um, but he, he, Immediately sets him to stardom. But in those films, Chang Che, the director who often worked with Jimmy Wang Yu, um, knew that he wasn't a martial artist and promoted him for his acting. And usually had a lot of great martial artists around him. And then Jimmy Wang Yu oftentimes would star in wuxia films of that time period uh, versus like these uh, kung fu flicks or uh, bashers, if you will, of fist to fist fighting. Um, so yes, Jimmy Wing Yu is not a great way. And you watch him and yeah, his form is not great in these movies. Uh, the guy never could really learn to kick right um, <laughs> his entire well, career. And yeah, it's funny because his big final move is like a giant cowboy punch. It's like, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, his flying punch. Um, it's, it's, it's oftentimes a little bit more fantastical than it needs to be. Um, it's funny Although, you mentioned Bruce Lee though. It, I was about to say, it's funny you mentioned Wuxia, because that's, when I, in my brain, when I shut off the part expecting it to be choreographed, like, uh, when I stopped expecting it to be like a Yu Wu-Ping kind of choreography, and I started taking it as a 70s Wuxia, more fantasy, and focusing on the, the story and the mystical powers of it all, I definitely enjoyed it a lot more than when I was trying to see it as a serious kung fu movie. Yeah, and, and what's funny is Yu Wu-Ping does his, uh, is also a pretty pretty very impressive choreographer for for uh, more hand-to-hand -hand combat movies it was in his later career that he really started really focusing on the wire work and things like that but um it's funny you mentioned bruce lee in this because one of my controversial opinions about jimmy wang yu is that i think jimmy wang yu is a fantastic actor um, i actually think he's a really good director too he directs this film and, and i think he has to work around with what he has in this movie um, he's he's working for Golden Harvest at this point um, before he was working with Shaw Brothers. And eventually he would go to Taiwan and, and start making films there uh, for various political reasons that we won't get into uh, too much here. Um, but he's got a very layered career in those regards. His film I mentioned before, The Chinese Boxer, I am a firm believer, really, really set the groundwork for audiences to accept Bruce Lee. Because it was a film where he literally stripped out almost all the fantasy elements and it has almost the exact same plot as Fist of Fury. 
uh, which would come later, like two years after it. And um, it's really be remade into my favorite Kung Fu movie, Fist of Legend. Fist of Legend with Jet Li. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so a Chinese Boxer is an incredible film, and I actually think it might be... Um, I'm a huge fan of the original One-Armed Swordsman. I think that might be Jimmy Wang Yu's best performance. But in terms of like him setting, trying to push boundaries for the genre, he definitely did some interesting things with Chinese Boxer that I truly do believe set the groundwork for Bruce Lee to be the success that he is. Uh, Bruce Lee was just a, a more natural martial artist. Now, it wasn't that these a lot of these actors weren't actual martial artists, that oftentimes the stuntman's secondary characters were, especially later on towards the 70s, you've got that. But this film, you're absolutely right. It's kind of edited around gore and things like that. He, Jimmy Wing, you smart enough to punctuate the film with a lot of memorable moments mm-hmm. to get away with kind of some of the the haphazard choreography, and it, which is sad because the action director of this movie is Chen Shi Wei, and he's, who's actually a really good action choreographer. But there's some good stuff in here still. Yeah, no, no, no. For everything... I could say about, you know, um, the choreography when Tien whoops the shit out of the uh, karate apprentices, he broke one of their arms. And so the man from Okinawa, that's literally, that was his name in the dub I watched. So I don't know. In the dub, yeah. Uh, Like literally just jumps in and karate chops his arm off and it's just instant and it's so cool. Like that that kind of stuff is great. You know, it had almost the pacing of a horror movie as far as that goes. Right. Well, and there's a lot of interesting, I mean, outside of, as you mentioned, the guy who can walk on his hands, um, which Jimmy Wayne, you defeats by walking on his one hand by bouncing on his fingers. It's um, something he's yeah, walking on a, one finger on one. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. Um, but there's a scene where they're fighting in the mill and he breaks the guy's arm in the gears that and then, and then he, throws him out the window and that then is throws so him metal <laughs> it's fucking glorious so that was pretty cool yeah i think jimmy when you was just smart enough to punctuate this film with those kinds of moments so that you forgive some of the the sloppiness or the 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 looseness of the choreography in the film and he just piles on fact, the choreography it's just yeah. non-stop i was gonna say um I'll, I'll touch on it when we actually get to the second movie but, you know, even as the more notable gore hound between the two of us, actually the second movie had a scene that made me straight up uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, we won't get to the second movie. Um, I, yeah, for that. But um, I, I, think you're, I think you're right to touch base that this is definitely Jimmy Wing use showcase for himself. Uh, both as an actor, I I have a, as you said, I actually have some problems with this movie. I think the um, the narrative is so focused on the action that it tends to forget a lot about the characters and what they're actually doing. I mean, Jimmy Wang Yu's character uh, Tian is very very two dimensional, and when they add in a weird romantic subplot in the third that de- act, that develops in the course of three minutes of him being a jackass <laughs> absolutely and you're like what is this in here for um what is this romantic subplot um it's introduced way too late it's rushed through and and jimmy Wang Yu once once his school is defeated i mean it takes two acts for his school to get destroyed but once his school is destroyed he is a dick he's an absolute dick um and you kind of root for him to be that way but then why are we introducing a romantic subplot at this point um, but at the same time, like every one of the final techniques he learns in the end is kind of that too. Cause you never, and it's a weakness only in the sense of I, I, I was missing it, but you never get that like cool training sequence either. Like you said, it's a montage, but it's a montage like Rocky four, like, and it's quickly the, run through. Yeah. They just sprint through all of this training and all of the, all of the stuff that's like super fun in other kung fu movies. I'm a big fan of the training montage. You know, the the wandering wandering through the woods being like, "Well, how can I defeat the technique?" and then he sees, you know, a bear slice down a tree to get to something and he's like, "Oh, oh, bear slice." Bear slice, right. Right. Cat jump like uh Jackie Chan does and uh... Exactly. And <laughs> and this movie 
does not have that. That is not the focus. As a matter of fact, him getting his arm built up to the strength to fight all these people is literally, in the version I watched, described as an elixir. Yeah. Oh, it, it truly is. And I love that they're like, the medicine man is like, okay, he's got to kill the nerve ending, so he burns him off, right? He totally roasts his hand. And then the, then the guy was like, he has to keep this soaking, in my version, you have to keep this soaking in the elixir for 20 days or some shit like that. Yeah. It's like not even a short time period. Uh-uh. Like, I was like, what? Um, and I do love that it gives him superhuman strength. Like yeah. it's not even just like, oh, like he now can't feel pain or anything. <laughs> Which speaking of him being a, a, a dick to test the superhuman strength, he just busts down the gazebo in the medicine man's yeah. house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and even better, she calls him out for it. <laughs> She's like, it will take five days to rebuild that. You're such an asshole. Right. But that's the romantic subplot. That's what we have. <laughs> uh, oh, and then he uses her as bait immediately. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's such a good character, right? Um, <laughs> so good. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, it's, I think it's an interesting film um, simply because it is a combination of some of his older films uh, combined. It does lay the groundwork, obviously, for a sequel to come out of it. Which, uh, and you know, obviously I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just given the stuff that, that shocked or I thought was a little like mad about the movie, but again, I want to be clear. Like I was overall positive on it. I'd, I'd actually give it a higher rating than you did personally. I I'd go close to like a three, five, maybe a four, even it's, there's a lot of good here. It's, it's very much mythological storytelling. Like I said, um, it's almost childish and it's good versus evil. Oh, but. it's yeah. Very simple. <laughs> I mean, the good guys are justice club. The bad guys are the iron hook plan. <laughs> so, yeah. but you know, sometimes that's not a bad thing. No, no, not at all. Um, I, I one other note I wanted to make is that, um, in case people have trouble finding it, it was released in the U S as the Chinese professionals when it first came out. It was, it was kind of a big release, got a theatrical release here in the U S and everything in the seventies. Um, cause this was the 1972 was the boom, the, uh, the Kung Fu craze, if you will, here in the U S um, which actually was kicked off by five fingers of death uh, the year prior, um, which was again, a movie that really kind of sets the groundwork for Bruce Lee to, exist as as the person he does um in the genre yeah, right 30, yeah 30 yeah 36 chambers of shaolin yep so yeah in the 70s it was it weirdly enough it was uh, five fingers of death which is a shaw brothers movie that kind of kicked everything off um and during this time period is when when bruce lee obviously uh kind of came into into the scene and uh kind of swept a, a lot of the glory even though he a lot of other artists put in the work to lay the foundation for him to succeed. So, um, so that's, that's kind of how that is. Um, I have a lot of controversial opinions on Bruce Lee um, as a martial arts fan. Uh, sometimes I feel bad because he takes so much of the credit for some of the things that he didn't do. So um, including, you know, uh, from Jimmy Wang Yu, who I think uh, really did a lot of work to set up, the martial arts films to change over in the 1970s but yeah no no generally however as a first time viewing and you know 50 years later at that this is it's still very enjoyable movie i absolutely agree i think the entertainment value of the one-armed boxer is can be understated um there's a reason why he got a sequel as a matter of fact, it's literally the perfect breezy on in the background movie. Yep. You don't have to think about it too hard. You watch a lot of fun action sequences, a lot of gimmicky action sequences. Um, mm-hmm. and, he, and as you said, Jimmy Wang Yu is, a, is a charming enough to get through uh, a lot of it with, that, with pretty ease, uh, with, enough, with enough ease um, to get through it. But uh, it's definitely a film that I do think, uh, not to spoil uh, too much about the ending of our podcast, but is a little bit outshined by its sequel. Uh, I think it is about time to get into. So, what did those silly llamas do? What did those llamas do? Now, the sequel, uh, one Arm Boxer versus The Flying Guillotine, or as it's most affectionately known in the U.S. as Master of the Flying Guillotine, from 1976, also directed by Jimmy Wang Yu, uh, written and starring him once again, is about the uh, villain of the film. Weirdly enough, 
drives the narrative in this movie more so than anyone else. You could argue that he's the protagonist of this film. Fung is his character's name, uh, is the villain. He finds out that his two students were killed by the one-armed boxer in the finale of the original film. They are the two llamas that, that Tien does defeat in the rock quarry at the end of the first film. He gets messaged via pigeon, decides that he's going to have to uh, exit his mountain life living, go find the one-armed boxer and take vengeance for his students. So he literally blows up his house <laughs> and um, <laughs> decides to go on this quest for vengeance. And he happens to be an ex-imperial guard, part of the flying guillotines uh, assassins group who uh, has a very distinctive weapon, a weapon that you throw, lands on somebody's head, and then takes off their head uh, with razor sharp blades. It is a flying guillotine. Um, so he's after the one armed boxer who has now started his own school. He has started his school. He's uh, learned some new techniques, including the ability to walk on walls, <laughs> as we noticed at one point. Uh, also known in Wuxia films as the light foot technique. Um, this ability to jump very high or walk very lightly, uh, as, as most notable that most, uh, Western audiences would know from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, the ability to walk on like whispery willows and stuff like that. Um, he has learned that technique. He has a new school. Uh, there is a huge tournament that is coming to town. They, he has been invited, decides not to participate. He's tired of kicking everybody's ass, I guess. So, uh, he's a, uh, a bystander in this, in this tournament, we get a lot of fighting in this tournament from an, another batch of international fighters. Uh, so we get to see that again. Uh, not to interrupt your synopsis, but I will point out one is called Fights Without a Knife. And spoiler alert, his secret weapon is a knife. <laughs> it's the greatest plot twist ever. <laughs> It's so good. <laughs> but yes, we have an <laughs> international tournament of fighters. Uh, the uh, Fung, the villain, does show up looking for the one-armed boxer. There is a huge finale towards the end uh, of where they have to face off against each other. And uh, guess what? All's well that ends well. <laughs> so I already kind of broke in with uh, one of the things I loved, but this particular collection of international fighters is really, really fun. We've got more brown face god damn it but at least this guy actually has a cool power this time well he has a power this time oh um, his power is dalsim yeah actually he's the direct inspiration for dalsim his arms get super long and that you know for what it's worth not a bad effect again all in camera yeah yeah he's a an indian yoga a yogi i think mm -hmm. is the one that my my film refers to him as a yogi master who has the ability to stretch very long so yes uh street fighter pulling more more uh <laughs> questionable <laughs> concepts from this film for their game um fights without a knife is also another japanese character um he actually uses uh tanfa or kind of what you think of as like a police nightstick but they have blades in them because of course yeah well yeah everyone's got hidden blades in this uh we have a guy who throws a hat that has hidden blades in it so yeah that's true a flying guillotine so good. so from just kind of my perspective much improved a lot of the choreography in this movie's better um and then there's also some of the some of the violence is really really cranked up um i don't think we're quite ready to get into the scene that squicks me out but uh laying that foundation there is another uh siamese boxer in this as well who kind of is mad that the one-armed boxer isn't fighting in the tournament so he helps fung uh find him and find yep. school um, so he sort of betrays, I mean, in as much as he can betray someone that he's never physically met, I, I don't know. The the politics in kung fu movies are always interesting. Right. Well, yeah, he's just, he's looking to, he wants to, he wants to beat the best, right? So he's, yeah. uh, he's willing to uh, team up to be able to defeat this guy. So, um, yeah, you always get that kind of stuff. Other stuff I think is kind of awesome in this movie, um, you know, the, you, you describe him as an imperial guard, but the movie very heavily emphasizes the assassination part of that. Like, he was he was the leader of this, like, straight-up um, Qing dynasty death squad. 
who were taking out like anybody that was speaking up for the former Ming dynasty. And that's actually part of how the uh, two Lama apprentices um, get him to fight, is they actually specifically refer to the one-armed boxer as a Ming revolutionary. And <laughs> when he takes up his flying guillotine again, at least in the dub I watch, he's like, you know, I will not have their honor disrespected by being killed by a Ming. I was just like, oh, man. Yeah, and that's and that brings up. I guess this is this is the time to kind of bring this up oh, because. And then also, actually, his propensity for just like blowing up everything. He has these like little contact bombs, and he just throws them, and everything explodes. It's awesome. It's amazing. Yes, as a so, so two things to kind of. I, I, let's just start with the first thing, which is the villain. I think that the villain in this film makes this movie as much as as much as Tian, the one armed boxer, is an interesting hero. I mean, he's a dick at the end of the movie. He's very much much more of a master in this. So he has a little bit more of an even keel head. He has to play things smarter in this film versus just fucking people to death. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the movie has a, a much smarter narrative in that. But I do really believe that the villain makes this film. Uh, Fung is a fascinating villain because he has, number one, there's a new narrative layer to this, which is a political one, uh, which is a historical one. Uh, with the Ming and Qing dynasty uh, dynasties, so that's something to keep in mind. And then along with the flying guillotine, which um, in nineteen, so the year before this, in nineteen seventy five, the Shaw brothers released a movie called The Flying Guillotine, um, which is a movie about the assassin squad that uh, goes after the revolutionaries and about how one of the members of the assassin squad starts to not believe in the propaganda they're being fed and decides to fight back against it. So it's him being hunted by his own co-workers, essentially, right? These other assassins. Uh, and about how he has to figure out a way to defeat the flying guillotine, uh, which is a, a, the exact same weapon. It is a weapon that they throw down. It's almost like a bladed frisbee. that when it lands on top of somebody's head and net drops down, it slices off their um, head and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, decapitates them so that the uh, assassins could bring the head in to prove that they killed the person. So that that is something that was uh, in the original Shaw Brothers movie. Uh, this one quickly jumps on that because that was a very popular film to be able to be like, oh, like, here we go. Uh, here's what we're going to run with this. So uh, if you guys want uh, listeners out there, there is a fantastic article that goes into the history of the flying guillotines um, as a weapon uh, in cinematic history. Uh, the article is called The Flying Guillotine Series and All Its Weird Glory. Uh, it's written by a good friend of mine, Craig Lyons. Um, it's a few years old. He wrote it for Den of Geek in the UK. I do highly suggest checking out that article. It does go through all of the films, uh, including this one, that kind of utilize this as a uh, cinematic weapon uh, as it goes forward. Um, so that's kind of the first thing, is the flying guillotine is very much a gimmick, but it's utilized very well here. The second thing is I do firmly believe the, the villain in this movie is its protagonist. He is the one that is driving the narrative action in this film. Um, you Even as he's like... Uh, hunting down one-armed boxers and just killing anyone with one arm at this point. This poor guy uh, claims to be a one-armed boxer to try to get out of pain for his lunch uh, in one scene and gets decapitated. <laughs> or, or the other one-armed boxer who was claiming nothing but to be a decent martial artist at a tournament. Yeah, he <laughs> gets fucking killed. Uh, uh, Fung is driving the narrative uh, The go to this because Tian is introduced as kind of a bystander in the first two acts of this film. Um, well, you know, and what's kind of fascinating to me is, um, I think that Fung is also like, he's not relatable. He's definitely the bad guy here, but by God, he is having so much fun. Yeah. He's, you almost root for him <laughs> through the first like half of this movie. You're like, I, and the movie sets this up perfectly. And I will say this because I did see this in theaters and the audience, like I've never heard an audience like cheer as loudly as this at a Kung Fu movie. But in the opening sequence, when he gets the note and he, you see him start practicing with his flying guillotine to like, you know, shake the rust off. And then he literally, as he's walking away from the straw hut in the mountains, throws one of his bombs into the middle of it and burns it to the ground. Never looks back. Not that he would. Uh, I, I think we forgot to mention he's blind. Um, he's Somehow also blind. we did forget to mention that he's blind. But yeah, yeah, no, Fung is, is also blind. So 
But I actually like that this movie does kind of the same thing that, <laughs> this is a great comparison, the animated series Avatar The Last Airbender does, where it acknowledges that he's blind, and it acknowledges the pluses and minuses with that but it never treats it as a weakness it just because um you know part of the finale which i'm i'm not jumping up too far ahead but part of the finale is releasing birds in this small area where he could no longer track where tian is yeah because he is super heightened hearing it's the daredevil thing actually yes yeah. because he is a total badass Right, and they and they kind of present him as that 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 his lack of sight has made him even deadlier. Deadlier, yeah, yeah. It's almost treated as like it has empowered him to be even a, a more ruthless kind of killer um, in in his abilities to be a killer because he's a, he's a trained killer before. And they even kind of explain a little bit of his backstory going into to how he lost his eyesight in the in the version I have, um, mm. which is an extended version. It has like six minutes more footage. Or so. Interesting, but true. I watched this on Vudu for free, and it was the full extended version. Nice. But it was still the old 70s dub, which didn't cover the extended scenes. So I have about six minutes of this movie in raw Chinese that I don't actually know what happened. <laughs> but they were there. That sounds about right. <laughs> See, I have the DVD, the uh, the ultimate edition DVD of this that was released in the U.S. Um, I kind of capitalize on um, it, its success and how many people reference this film. Um, I, I forgot to mention, uh, I guess this is as good time as any to mention this, but the original one arm boxer did not have a rotten tomato score for mm. pretty obvious reasons. I don't think critics really saw that movie or were able to write about it. It did have an 85% audience score though. Um, which is, uh, pretty surprising to see that one, that one that high, but, uh, this movie, this movie master of the flying guillotine. 90% on Rotten Tomatoes from critics and an 87% yeah. from audiences. So easy to see why it's um everything is much much improved. Um Jimmy Wang Yu still didn't like learn kung fu in the what 3 years. But everybody else in this feels a lot more legit. Now oh. that could just be perception, but it did. A lot of the fighting in this felt a lot more just mm. Yeah, in full full disclosure that has to go to the fight choreographer for this movie. And there there's actually two uh, listed people for the fight, for the action direction in this film, um, uh, over on HKMDB, which is the Hong Kong movie database. Um, and the two people that are uh, noted on this are uh, Larkar Wing and Larkar Lung. Uh, Larkar Lung is the uh, notable director and action choreographer for Shaw Brothers Studio, who did like 36 Chamber of Shaolin and uh, incredible films like, uh, you know, uh, Marshall Club and Challenge of the Masters. He was one of the first fight choreographers in uh, in the Hong Kong studio to be like, I want to use real martial arts. Uh, he was a practitioner of Hungar um, and he's an incredible, incredible artist. And quite frankly, in my personal opinion, you modern action cinema owes a substantial chunk um, of how fight sequences are done to him, to mm -hmm. to his abilities as a fight choreographer. But it's him and his brother. It's his brother is Lockhart Wing, uh, who is uh, also credited as a fight choreographer. Uh, Lockhart Wing is actually a small role in this movie. He's the, um, oh geez, in the international fighter sequence, the guy with the three section staff. That's oh, Lockhart okay. Wing. Yep. So Which it, for some reason the dub called a long spear, and I was like, "But that's a three section staff." The original Thirty Six Chambers of Shaolin is about that. They kind of the invention of that weapon. So that's so. right. That is that's kind of the whole second act. Yes, yes, uh, about him using that weapon to be able to defeat all of the fighters. So um, yeah, so that is uh, something there um, for for you guys. The fight choreography, because he's such an incredible fight choreographer, probably the best the industry has ever seen. For in my humble opinion. Uh, is also, uh, low car long. weird little, um, weird little tiny detail. Just jumping back on my avatar, the last airbender kick. Cause, uh, I just recently blitzed through all that on Netflix, but, uh, earthbending is hungar. Hungar. That, that was their animation reference for earth. Oh, I did not know that. I've never seen that show. So, 
Mm-hmm. I know. Oh yeah, no, no. All, all four actually, all four bending styles reference real martial arts. So kung fu fans should all actually watch it because it's really, Ooh. it's really well animated. Actually, oh, I should definitely watch it then because I would be very fascinated to see that. Yeah, Hong Gar being a, a very effective martial arts style. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, so that's. I think that that's where your. I, I think your note about the action looking better is just true. I think it's just a better action choreographer for it. And even though the film does have a lot of gimmicks to it, uh, including mm-hmm. a fight in a burning house where the floor is heated. So, yeah, let's just jump into that. Um, so the Siamese boxer is a bad guy, and he did do a bad thing. But, man, this is brutal. So basically they have this house with a, a metal floor, and they kind of trick him into fighting the one-armed boxer in there. And then they throw a bunch of burning straw underneath, so this is slowly becoming like an oven surface. But they've got spears at all the windows, so um, this Muay Thai boxer who doesn't wear shoes is having to fight in the house that the entire floor is just burning, and his feet are like sizzling on this thing, and it is so gnarly. And I'm like... It's not even, it, it's clever, and it is, I can see, you know, why that would be the solution to fight this guy, but this guy also wasn't presented as, like, a strong enough fighter to need that kind of solution. <laughs> like, it seems like such overkill <laughs> in the context of the movie, and I'm like, holy shit. Because <laughs> it is so gnarly. Like, you see his feet blistering and stuff, you know, it's not the world's best makeup effects, but it's enough that I was uncomfortable. Oh, for sure. And I love it when, when he's defeated, right? And then they pull him out of the house. They they enter the camera. And he jumps it's, in this water. Yeah. I just love that the camera's like even focused on the, the bad guy's feet, the Thai boxer's yeah. feet, like and how blistered and like ashen and burnt they are or whatever as he's being carried out. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of a, a weird thing. It just goes to show you that this film is less about just kind of a beat em up and a little bit more about being clever with its choreography and action sequences. Uh, that you know, the that Tian, the one-armed boxer, has to be smarter uh, about just, defeating uh, these people. I mean, even even for a grindhouse movie, I think I was just having an excess of case of sympathy because I'm like, that's that's like brutal compared to the crime. That's uh, brutal. Yeah, uh, you could say he felt the agony of defeat. Mm. Is that no no? Mm. Hold on, you need to pause for applause. I'm just all right. Goodbye. I'm I'm out. That's yeah. <laughs> You taking off your headphones? Good <laughs> God! So yes, so that is a uh, yeah, that is the Thai boxer. So yeah, the movie again. The structure for this movie is uh, you get introduced to the characters um, of Fung hunting down the one-armed boxer, the one-armed boxer doing his school thing. The second act is once again a martial arts tournament. Um, so again, your Street Fighter references abound here. Uh, All of that uh, references and uh, inspiration is here in the second act. Again, it's one of my problems with this film is that, man, the martial arts tournament, as much as there's a lot of cool action fights, the fighting on top of the poles or the knives down below. It screeches the plot to a halt, yeah. It's just like, oh, and and by the way, remember how cool that sequence was in the first one? Let's do it again. (laughs) And I don't don't love it. Don't love it. it. The action is great. Uh, there's a lot of fun fight sequences here. It does introduce some of the characters that will become that, you know, uh, Tian or Fung will end up having to fight later on. But mm-hmm. other than that, it, it does screech everything to a halt. And then once again, in the third act, you get uh, Tian uh, just trying to defeat the uh, assassin. So. so what I will say is having this movie structured around um, coming up with a clever way to beat the flying guillotine instead of just a new technique is actually kind of fun and i will say they set it up almost like in oceans 11 or like a heist where it's like you see him setting up the plan and he's whispering in this guy's ear he's like i'd like to rent out your shop and they're installing all this stuff and you have no idea what it is but you know he's like inspired by this axe you see chopping some uh, bamboo and then it all comes to head where ah, ah, it all comes to oh, head. oh. <laughs> no you um, gotta leave that at the door <laughs> where he uh forces you know fong into a fight in this like small thicket of bamboo and then uh it basically breaks the guillotine or at least the uh 
guillotine mechanism. He's still able to kind of throw it as like a spike buzzsaw thing, but it's not quite the same um, for the rest of the movie. And then they get into this, uh, come on, what was it, like a linen shop? And what you find out these metal contraptions are, are these axe slinging things. So he kind of hits his thing and he confuses him with the birds, like I kind of mentioned earlier. And then basically, um, is throwing rocks around while hanging from the ceiling to kind of get Fong looking in every direction. And then by the time it's a real fight again, he's stepping on these mechanisms that, you know, Fong's trying to deal with Tien fighting. And then all of a sudden there's an ax in his goddamn chest because they sling axes. Yeah. It's a, you know, that the, the ending we all like of the last Rambo film, Mm -hmm. it's like that except martial arts and ax flinging. (laughs) So, No, it's, it's, yeah, he's setting up all these clever traps to, because he, and it's interesting that he immediately knows, I cannot beat this guy. This guy has me beat. Yeah. You know, and so he has to be clever about it. No way in a fair fight, yeah. No, in a fair fight, I cannot win against this guy. This guy is too good, you know. To be fair, though, um, what it kind of sets up and the idea it sets up and the reason it doesn't bother me as much as like uh, the Thai boxer is that in this case, it's presented as because there is no fair fight against Fong. Fong is not fighting for honor. Fong is trying to fucking murk you. Absolutely. And uh, that's a very distinctive. uh, I'm glad that you picked up on that. That's very distinctive for martial arts movies. There's this idea of like the honorable fight and then the dishonorable fight. Right. Um, And you know, if you, the, the villain being dishonorable, you have to, if to fight for justice, to be able to, you know, defeat the villain, you have to kind of use whatever tactics are necessary. And it's a, a change in tone, especially in the 1970s, uh, as martial arts go, th- go forward. So I think well, that that's as someone really that has spent a lot more time with, um, Japanese cinema and especially like samurai film, you know, lone wolf and cub, all that stuff. You get so hooked into the idea of Bushido and you know a hero must always be in the lesser position and the chinese philosophy of uh no fuck that if he's gonna fight dirty i'm gonna fight dirtier it's kind of refreshing in a way but it's shocking in a way too yeah and and again that that's something that's much later like if and and even like genre wise for kung fu movies it's kind of game uh wuxia films you don't necessarily see that there's very much kind of the honorable death versus like ever fighting for dishonor or anything like that. You know, it makes it for uh, some interesting moments in it. I I do think that this film does have these moments where it actually gets a little bit too weird, (laughs) which going back to the linen shop with the axes, there's actually a scene where Fung spins his head around 360 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Like actually what the fuck like that. Like every time I watch this movie, I'm like, God, that is such a weird like, is he an owl? Like, is he like, what the fuck is this? Like, why is this a thing suddenly? Um, but on the flip side, and it's something we brushed past because I, I forgot to bring it up and I definitely wanted to, was, um, you know, during the tournament, there's the guy who demands a bunch of spears be thrown into the ground. And then he's like fighting, standing on these like sword tips while his opponent's standing on like the bamboo tops. And yeah. that's that, you know, it, it walks all over this uh, spectrum because like... Everything like that that I'm sort of into, there's a scene with Tien, like you said, walking on the walls that I'm like, oof. oof. Yeah, it gets a little bit too weird at times. Um, I, I I wish that it, it would delete those more fantastical elements because um, it does kind of break its own rules for the world by doing so at times. Um, the, the 360 degree head, that one always gets. Um, I'm even willing to do the, the light foot technique, but like... <laughs> like that just comes out of nowhere. Here's a uh, here's a controversial shot, and I think it might even get us a little ways into the collected theme discussion, or kind of jumping into both these movies as a franchise. But as much as I like about both of these movies, and it's a lot, I actually think this might be kind of ripe for a remake. Could you imagine a modern version of both of these films with modern choreography and such? Absolutely. I would be completely and utterly game for a one on boxer remake, or even Master of the Flying Guillotine remake. Um, it is notable that they did try to remake the Flying Guillotine, very loose remake, um, as a movie called The Guillotines uh, from a handful of years ago, directed by Andy Lau. Um, and that movie's terrible. For whatever, it's the writing is so convoluted. The concept is still sound, especially about the group of assassins and whatnot. But man, it's it's convoluted. 
I do agree. Like you could probably do this in a really, really slick way they, or even, you know, yeah. Cause at this point, obviously the franchise is done. Uh, last entry was 1976. It's not like you're going to make a sequel to this, but um, or you could do something that's really clever, like a reinterpretation of it. I don't know. I don't had, did you do happen to see the movies movie? As, oh, I was going to say, do both movies as one have, uh, you know, the first two acts ostensibly be the one armed boxer and the last three acts do a classic Chinese five act structure be the flying guillotine. You could have a, you know, near two and a half hour movie and get all of the story of both of these yeah. in pretty easy. Well, in, you could literally do something that's cool. Like, I don't know. Um, I know I mentioned the Jimmy Wayne, you filmed the one armed swordsman, but did you have a, chap- a chance to see the film? Dra- it was released in the U S as dragon with Donnie Yen. Oh, uh, the recent one. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. So like that one started off as a remake for one armed swordsman and then it became something else. So that by the third act, it was a surprise remake when he loses his arm and has to take up a one armed swords technique. In like the third act, uh, right. notable because Jimmy Wayne U plays the villain in that movie. He plays Donnie Yen's dad, who's oh. the final villain in the house where um, Donnie Yen must fight him in the house to save right, his right, family. Right. Um, yeah, Jimmy Wayne U plays the villain. He does. He's fantastic in that movie. I think he's horrifying in that movie. He's just a, you know terrifying presence in it. Um, right. But that was a movie that was like. Oh, here's a kind of a an old school martial arts flick, and then you're like in the third act. Oh shit! Here it is. It's a remake of One Arm Swordsman. Comes out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. You could do something like that because, like, even in the first film for One Arm Boxer, it's not like he loses his arm right away. Um, no. He doesn't lose it until the third act. As a matter of fact, um, if the movie hadn't been called One Arm Boxer, frankly, it would have been a hell of a surprise because it, it's like I even mentioned earlier when we were talking about it. Like, it's so instant. Yeah. You could have called it Justice Club. I was <laughs> um, for that, but no, I would be game for a remake of this. You know, now that uh, you know the Chinese film industry is kind of leaning into making films the Hollywood style um, more and more every year. I feel like that they lean into it. Uh, they're starting to do more remakes and more reimaginings and things like that. So it wouldn't shock me if this uh, came up again. I mean, the fl- again, guillotine. The guillotines is a remake that, uh, from my understanding, just didn't didn't bode well for it so i don't know Hmm. Um, i mean on the other hand though uh, we're also in a second golden age of chinese cinema because like a lot of chinese movies right now are really really strong and i mean not even just in the martial arts or action space i liked wandering earth personally yeah i loved wandering earth and that was like a movie that was completely and utterly uh you know to go off on a tangent here was uh, completely inspired by hollywood if Mm -hmm. if that movie didn't feel like a roland emmerich yeah, it's yeah. it's totally like here's a Roland Emmerich movie. It's just Chinese, you know, and you're like, mm-hmm. and it really works better than most Roland Emmerich films. So, so yeah, yeah, I was a big fan of that one myself. But yeah, we are in that age where you know it is the second largest film going country now. You know, at least pre pandemic. Yeah, because it, so we'll um, it be it finally beat out Bollywood, didn't it? Yeah, it did. So um, finally, uh, uh, for it, I mean, they have a. a a lot of people so i guess for box office purposes that's how it goes but i mean it, uh, china now is a place where you can have a movie like wolf warrior 2 which only gets a theatrical release in china and then a smattering of like select theaters here in the u.s like six theaters or something but it basically only gets a theatrical release in china and is one of the highest grossing films of all time period or something like uh neja was the same way yeah, yeah, one of the yeah for uh, I mean the money that it, that movie did and as an animated film in China is just insane. So uh, so there's room for a remake. For Which sure. uh, by the way, certain uh, famous writer had a pull quote on the Nesha box. I heard. Uh, yes, I did. Thank you for <laughs> embarrassing me in front of all of our <laughs> listeners. I was very excited to, especially when I picked up my 4K copy of it uh, to be on the front cover of it. But, um, I, I I love that movie, and I can't wait for its sequel. It's a very so, good movie, actually. Yeah. yeah. Very excited. So, um, but yeah, I would I'd be game for a Master of the Flying Guillotine sequel uh, for sure. I'd love that. So, um, yeah. Why don't we? Uh, so we've talked a little bit about both films. Uh, hopefully, we didn't. I don't think we missed anything too egregious. Um, uh, at least. In, well, I in, mean, they're they're reasonably simple films. Um, I think thematically, there's definitely a basic theme of justice and you know the noble hero etc it's like i said it's a very good versus bad in that sense um 
So the bad guys are like really bad, you know. It's not just the the vampire from Okinawa, but it's also even the leader of the Iron Hooks was uh like I said, he was like a mobster. He's he's running prostitution and gambling and all this stuff. Opium. As a matter of fact, that's how he met the uh mercenaries he picks up was from the opium deal. Right. Yeah, and you know, in even going off of that, obviously there's as I mentioned, the kind of pro Chinese approach to things versus the international the baddies and things like that. But also the movie is a uh, very much takes it kind of that traditional martial arts theme of having kind of a working class guy. This guy is a uh, hardworking student in the first one and a, and a hardworking teacher who doesn't want glory or anything like that in the second one, um, you know, as he's fighting corruption in both films. In the first one, it's a corruption of uh, the kind of the martial arts system. This guy is using his martial arts school to be a front for all these awful businesses and corrupt businesses and things like that. And then in the second one, a, a corrupt assassin, who an assassin who... Uh, you know, probably didn't get his due uh, when there was the regime change. and and uh... Something I did find interesting about Fong is that he's also a fanatic. I, I, I actually did touch on a little bit, sorry. But, um, you know, I, on top of that, he's he's literally a fanatic. He's a, a political fanatic. Right, and, and I do love this idea that him and both of his students dressed as monks, mm-hmm. as, as these Tibetan religious figures to blend into society even though that's not what they were and yeah. they're certainly uh, and particularly by the, the 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 early 70s and the mid 70s there was a lot of riots going on um in in china there was a lot of anti-government protesting um at this point so i certainly think that that tone feeds into these films uh, this is kind of a fight against authority for the right, for the right reasons for this justice and and to be a good person. Um, so I do I do like the fanatical element to that to the villain. Again, I think the villain kind of makes the second one. I think he single handedly makes it better than the first. Um, but I also think that it's kind of fascinating that these movies basically have the same plot. <laughs> Um, they they get to the long fight sequence and the foreign fighters in slightly different ways, but I mean the arc of these films is ostensibly the same. Yeah. Um, down to it being someone going after Tien both times because technically it's still vengeance for a perceived slight. Yeah, and um, you know even though that Tien, uh, rightfully so, just uh, defeated his students because he was protecting himself uh, these were guys that were hired to kill him and it was in self-defense essentially uh even though there's certainly a vengeance plot to that but like i like i said in their even in their uh letter to their master they lied and said he was a ming revolutionary right yep uh that'll be you know and it makes you wonder if that's what they were told you know mm-hmm. to be able to get them on their side or something to that effect that this uh this corruption just keeps continuing on but um i think that that's a heavy theme in this movie this almost fight against authority figures uh, whether it's government officials or, uh, you know, corrupt businessmen or whatever that might be, um, that there's kind of this fight by by a just, hardworking, blue-collar guy. Well, even that there's just kind of an ob- objective sense of justice. This is right, this is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a, a nice little depth to it. Again, it's a depth that martial arts movies tend to lean on. Uh, you know, if we ever do more martial arts franchises, we will certainly be talking about that again and again and again and again. Well, I mean, this is our second martial arts franchise after the American Ninjas. Yeah, this is... <laughs> Wait, that was a martial arts franchise? Uh, yeah. Hey, <laughs> Ninjutsu's first, a martial art? <laughs> canon first, Ninja second, martial arts third. Um, <laughs> I, that's true. That is technically our first one. So, um, but yeah, so that's... I mean, other than that, I'm not sure that there's a lot of uh, themes. I mean, there's obviously re- reoccurring motifs. As you said, these films have very similar plots, very similar narrative structures, um, you know. But uh, other than that, thematically, they're, they're pretty straightforward. Um, not too much depth into it. Although, like I said, there's certainly details in each one uh, that you can certainly pull out. 
Um, like Absolutely. I said, the dress of the the monks, of them hiding in religious garb or things like that, uh, certainly is open to interpretation for a variety of reasons. That's how that goes. Um. So then, I suppose, how would you rank these films? Because I'm, I mean, very simply, it's it's guillotine is the better of the two to me. Absolutely. I agree with you. Guillotine is the superior film. Uh, not that Boxer is a bad film. I think they both, uh, well, Master of the Flying Guillotine, I mean, 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. When I saw that, I kind of, my jaw kind of hit the floor. I never expected yeah. that high of a review. I mean, there wasn't a lot of reviews. I think there was like 20, right? But, um, and they were all retrospective reviews. Obviously, uh, I doubt this film would have gotten reviewed by very many critics when it came out originally. oh no i mean i mean if we we're talking mainstream this this wouldn't rank nearly that high genre you can always cut 40 percent off of any genre film straight off yeah yeah so uh, i mean a 90 percent is still impressive though uh, i do agree that it is the superior film i just think that a stronger choreography uh, for sure helps it a lot a lot of the ways i think tian is a much relate more relatable character in this in the second one than he is in the first and uh, it's just got a much stronger villain, uh, even though you have multiple villains in both. Uh, Fung Although, is just an incredible visual and tonal presence. In a broader sense, though, One Arm Boxer is definitely underseen. Like, it definitely deserves more attention than it gets. Um, highly agree on that. It is an underseen film that I do believe should be seen more, particularly in regards to this, because this film actually has flashbacks the sequences from that movie it does. done in a weird pink color which again yeah. bold choice um but it does have flashbacks to it. It, it this is a definitive sequel to it and i think as a franchise it's it's only two films they're both uh, relatively easy to find you can find both for streaming for free and so. it's uh it's less than a three-hour commitment neither movie i think both movies top out at like an hour 20 yeah yeah i think yeah i think master of the flying guillotine my extended cut is what 93 minutes or something like that with credits yeah yeah it's it's not like yeah you're devoting an entire week to this franchise oh you know what something i did want to mention on uh guillotine since i mentioned the soundtrack um flying guillotine has a weirdly heavy soundtrack and i mean in a metal sense like it's it's heavy bass and drums i was like holy crap oh for sure and it's kind of awesome i mean yeah. s- soundtracks in martial arts films particularly from this era are kind of throwaway things oftentimes it's stolen music and sometimes weirdly stolen music you'll be like i don't understand why the music from monty python is in this movie but um you know you'll get those kinds of things but i actually think jimmy wang Yu, uh in whatever way was uh, smart in both the music choices i mean the shaft music in the first one certainly feeds in kind of the fun tone of it so um yeah that's the uh that's the one arm boxer franchise one arm boxer it's only two films long but you know uh, uh it's a quick watch i love these films i'm happy to talk about a martial arts some like legitimate martial arts films not that american ninja is not legitimate i'm not saying i don't <laughs> want to hurt your feelings but uh you know it's, it's good to talk about something like this um as you know, but maybe our listeners aren't, aren't there, but I was a writer for various martial arts sites. I'm currently one of the writers for 36 Styles, um, the website there, uh, doing some articles and things like that. So I'm very, very, very fond of the martial arts genre and talking about it and going through it. So I'm happy to do it. And anytime we get to, so, I mean, if you guys like this episode, definitely request more of this stuff. Happy to do more of these. Because um, believe me. I would love to do some more like Wuxia stuff. Uh, I've already pitched to Matt doing Storm Riders. Would you guys listen to that? I'd love to record that. Storm Riders. Oh my god. You don't want to hear my opinion. We're, we would probably be on two opposite spectrums on that. What I'm saying is, if the medicine man had looked at Tian and said, I have this demon arm that I need to give you. <laughs> four times better movie. Four times better movie. Um, I do want to point out that a weird coincidence is that uh, the Storm Riders movie, the 98 one, uh, is directed by um, uh, Andrew Lau, the guy who directed the Guillotines remake. No joke. Yeah, yeah. Weird uh, things for it. Um, yep. And then, because it was Storm Riders, what's the second one? It's called Storm Warriors? Yeah, Storm Warriors. Okay. Yep. And I have only seen each of those once, so I... Uh, and they're supposedly making a third one, so we'll see. We'll see if that ever actually comes out. I, I wonder... Or would you guys like a more conventional martial arts series like 36 Chambers? 
Boring. Okay. Anyway. Boring. No, boring. No, I was thinking we should just follow this up straight with uh, some more Jimmy Wang Yu and just do the One Arm Swordsman franchise. But that I've would actually, actually neither. I've never seen. I've never seen either of them. So. Ooh, it's so the One Arm Swordsman franchise is weird. Very weird. It would actually take us two episodes. Yeah, there's like six films in total. Regardless, more martial arts, more crossover. Mm-hmm. Maybe we even bring on a guest. You, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of kung fu reviewers. Yeah, absolutely. So, but um, yeah, nonetheless, that was the uh, One Arm Boxer franchise. Thank you for listening, guys. Um, you know, we have lots of stuff, as I said before, uh, in the uh, in the back catalog. So please go listen to that. Um, please check us out on our social medias. We have plenty of stuff on the interwebs. Uh, you can pick us out at Facebook at facebook.com uh, backslash no franchise fatigue. You can check us out at Twitter at the handle NFF pod. Uh, again, no franchise fatigue. Uh, you can check me out over at Twitter at the movie Matt. My name is M A T T. It's a four letter word. <laughs> Shithead. I, uh, <laughs> it's so good. And where can they find you, Sean? Uh, nffpod.sean at gmail.com You can also find the one on Boxer at nffpod.tn at uh, <laughs> <laughs> tn, tn uh, yeah but yes nffpod.sean at gmail.com my name is as always a four letter word and a much superior <laughs> one. Oh, much superior just cause yours is four different letters Hey, they don't ever, they don't call anything the M word, do they? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it. But thank you so much for listening, guys. We will see you next week for our next episode. And have a good night and don't lose your head. Or your arm. <laughs>